Great. Okay, so this is Enrico Perota. He is a quantitative ecologist with an interest in developing and applying new analytical methods to inform effective management and conservation of marine mammals. He is originally from Italy, where he studied for his bachelor's degree before moving to Scotland for his master's at the University of St. Andrews. He got his PhD in ecology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, working on the effects of disturbance on bottlenose dolphins. He now lives in Ireland, where he has been working remotely for the past seven years, first with Washington State University, and now as a research fellow at the Center for Research into Ecological and Environmentally, Environmental Modeling at the University of St. Andrews. He is currently involved in a series of projects focusing on the population consequences of stressors on marine mammals. Um, so Enrico is going to take questions at the end of the talk. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for coming to seminar today. And Enrico, feel free to start. Yeah, thanks very much, Zoe, for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you all tonight. Uh, well, not tonight for me, <laughs> during the day for you, uh, and be presenting to you this work uh, that, as you can see, is the result of a large collaboration among many people. So I, first of all, would like to acknowledge all my co-authors that you can see there, and also um, our funders, ONR and CERDI. So I'll be talking to you about the uh, development of a Bayesian state space model for whale health and vital rates that uh, we want to use to quantify the combined effects of multiple stressors. And as you will see, we're using North Atlantic right as uh, a case study. So just as a bit of background, as you all know, wildlife populations are exposed to many stressors, both on land and at sea. And the assessment and prediction of the combined effects of these stressors is a long-term goal across uh, disciplines. These stressors operate along different mechanistic pathways, by which I mean that uh, they have different ways in which they can affect uh, wildlife population. So, uh, of course, the effective management of these stressors require the uh, knowledge of the cumulative risk to a population of interest. So if we look at the figure on the right and uh, we have our target population in red, uh, which is, of course, in, immersed in, in its ecosystem with other components like prey and predators. And then we have different stressors represented as the yellow boxes, which emerge from different activities. So each stressor has um, an associated risk for the population a different degree of our ability to mitigate it and a different desirability of the activities that are associated with the stressor that generate it. And so we want to be able to compare the size of different stressor effects in order to uh, develop a management scenario that can allow us to reduce the cumulative risk to a population below some acceptable level. And uh, stressors can, of course, affect individuals uh, directly by uh, affecting their reproductive output or their survival, but most often they have indirect effects. And this is a problem for long-lived wide-ranging species such as marine mammals, because of course, it's really hard to come up with monitoring programs that uh, allow us to cover the entire range of a population or um, that go on for a sufficient amount of time that we are able to detect those effects, that we have the power to detect those effects. And um, often when we do see an effect at the population level, it's too late to do anything about it. So in general, when we're looking at combined effects of stresses, we have this tension between uh, situations where uh, we have a lot of data. Uh, and of course, uh, we can use data-driven approaches that um, can make few assumptions and therefore incur a low risk of bias, but of course they're also very noisy, they have low precision and therefore also low uh, predictive power. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have situations where we don't have a lot of data, we need to make many more assumptions, which of course can be wrong, uh, but this helps reduce the empirical noise and increase our predictive power. And where we sit along the spectrum depends uh, on the, the different um, species and data that we have available, but also the management uh, requirements. And for most uh, long-lived wide-ranging species, purely empirical analysis are often not possible, uh, especially for marine mammals. So we need to rely on more process-driven analysis where we build some information about the underlying mechanisms into our models to support uh, the models. 
So one such uh, mechanistically informed framework is the so-called population consequences of multiple stressors framework or PCOMS. For those of you in the marine mammal world, um, you probably recognize it as an extension of the PCOD framework, the population consequences of disturbance framework. So the idea is quite simple. We need to find a way to bridge the gap between things that we can observe, like the physiological or behavioral responses of individuals to um, stressors and things that we're interested in. So the population dynamics. And here we are just expanding to multiple stressors that you can see on the left side, each with its own dose, which can result, of course, in different responses. These responses can have an immediate effect on the vital rates of individuals or be mediated by uh, individual health, which is composed of different uh, currency variables. And then we can stack up the different individuals to um, look at the population dynamics. And we have also added these um, red crosses to represent the potential interactions at the various um, stages of this cascade. Which brings me to uh, our application, which is not Atlantic right whales. I'm sure you're all familiar with the species. Uh, they live along the east coast of the United States and Canada. Uh, most individuals are seen in the feeding grounds in the summer and fall in the north, and then the wintertime distribution is uh, less understood, but at least a portion of the population migrates to uh, Calvin ground in the south. And uh, because of this coastal distribution, they are exposed to a wide range of human activities. So they've been nicknamed the urban whale to highlight their um, proximity with, uh, with um, urban um, life along these coasts. As you also probably know, uh, these species is critically endangered. Uh, you can see the trend um, estimated by um, Pace et al. And you can see that the population was slowly recovering after being decimated by whaling up to more or less 2010, where we see uh, this trend plateauing and then um, decreasing quite dramatically in recent years. They are affected by a wide range of st uh, stressors that include uh, entanglements in fishing gear, vessel strikes, and climate change. And I want to say a couple of words about the latter one. Uh, recent evidence is suggesting that the uh, oceanography of the North Northwest Atlantic is changing. Uh, so there are climate driven changes in circulation and warming up of the water, which has led to consequences to the uh, prey of these species, uh, copepods. And uh, we, uh, as a result of that change in, in the prey, we have seen this shift in the distribution with the animals uh, starting to use the waters in the Gulf of St. Lawrence more and more in recent years. And of course, moving in these um, waters has exposed them to uh, new stressors or um, stressors from which th there, there were no protective policies in place when this shift bega began. And uh, this is part of this increased mortality that we have seen in uh, the last few years as a result from this uh, shift in distribution. So previous analysis have looked at the relationship between vital rates and, st and stressors directly, but in separate analysis. And um, this has the complication that it makes it hard to compare their effect sizes and therefore to do the prioritization of management efforts that uh, I was mentioning earlier. So the aim, for this study was to try and develop a model uh, for the health, survival, and reproduction of individual right whales that integrated the effects of those uh, stressors within the same model so that we could uh, compare their effect sizes directly and put them into the context of other uh, life history events that might also affect an individual, for example, lactation or the, tra the transition from calf to juvenile. So what data do we have available to uh, inform this model? We uh, had access to uh, the long-term sighting data set collated by the North Atlantic Right Whale uh, Consortium. These sightings come with photographic information that is used uh, to carry out this visual health assessment. So basically four uh, ordinal variables, body condition, skin condition, rate marks, and cyanide presence are scored according to either two or uh, three categories based on a qualitative assessment of the uh, pictures. So you can see an example on the right for the body condition score um, from top to bottom, the three, um, the three categories from uh, good body condition to poor body condition. We uh, also had uh, information on uh, sightings of females with their calves. 
information on the occurrence of anthropogenic traumas that is curated by uh, the, North, um, the New England Aquarium. And so this is uh, on entanglements in terms of uh, the dates of the entanglements, the duration, whether the gear was seen attached to the body of the animal and the severity of the injury associated with the uh, event. And then for vessel strikes, we had uh, the dates again and the type of injury. So this could be, for example, a deep cut, a shallow cut, or a blunt trauma in case of uh, necro necropsy. For the prey, uh, we use this prey abundance index uh, that is essentially an annual anomaly for uh, the main prey of the species, like the late stage uh, of Calanus um uh, which is a copepod. Uh, and so we have this abundance data that come from uh, the continuous plankton recorded data. Uh, this is a long term data set that has been collected since uh, the 60s. Uh, and we're using the abundance in the Gulf of Maine transect to derive this index. So it should be thought as, um, as an overall index, as an overall proxy of the, the quality of the, uh, of the habitat of these species rather than the specific availability of prey in different regions at the different times. So this resulted in almost 75,000 sightings of more than 700 individuals, mostly of known sex, uh, collected between the 70s and 2020. Almost 60% uh, of individuals are uh, first sighted as calves, so we know their entire uh, history. And we have 178 females with at least one calf, uh, more than 1,700 entanglement events, and 81 vessel strike events. So it's a, it's a pretty big uh, data set for uh, marine mammal species. Um, I'll give you an overview of the model, and then we'll go into the details. First of all, it's a state space model. So um, it has this uh, process component that describes the, uh, the state of the system and how it varies over time that we cannot observe directly. And then an observation model that um, describes the measurement process, uh, so the, the generation of the data. For the process model that you can see represented here, we're modeling health of an individual at different time steps, where the time step is uh, three months. And health is related then to the vital rates, uh, which are survival and reproduction. And then we have the observation model that describes uh, the, the data. And before I go into the details, I should say that uh, we are building on a previous model that was published by Rob Schick and colleagues in, in 2013. So starting from the process model, uh, and particularly from health, health at each time step um, depends on health at the previous time step, plus the effect of some intrinsic stressor Z, plus the effect of extrinsic stressors uh, W plus some Gaussian error. So the intrinsic stresses are the uh, transition for an individual between the calf state and the juvenile state. This is quite a, a stressful time in the life of an individual because the, it has to start feeding uh, autonomously. And then for females, uh, the lactation state, whether they had a dependent calf. Again, an energetically expensive uh, life stage for these animals. In terms of the extrinsic stressors, uh, we had the entanglements, both in terms of an immediate effect uh, on health that was differentiated by severity, and then the effect of um, a, pro a protracted effect that depended on whether the gear stayed attached to the body of the animal. For vessel strikes, uh, we had effects again differentiated by injury type, and then we had the prey abundance index, which had an effect in the June, July, August um, time step. So health was uh, directly related with survival. It's the silog log transformation of uh, survival probability. And um, survival probability then determines survival state uh, from a Bernoulli draw. And also, of course, if, if the animal will, was alive in the previous time step. In terms of reproduction, uh, the response is whether a female calved or not on ears when she was available to calve. So um, there's a lactation year where the female has a calf followed by a resting year, and then uh, she's um, available to calve uh, in the following year. So this again emerged from a Bernoulli draw based on calving probability and based on whether the, the female was alive, so the survival state. We are modeling the effect of health on calving probability at three possible legs, at the start, in the middle, and at the end of pregnancy. And we're using the sigmoid relationship characterized by three parameters, the steepness, uh, delta, the asymptote M and the location mu. 
And you can see that uh, I have an individual random effect on the uh, asymptote because uh, different individuals have a different uh, reproductive performance. And also there is that parameter G, which uh, represents essentially the, uh, whether the, the individual belongs to the reproductive, reproductive cohort or not. And this is because some individuals, even though they're mature, they're in good health, um, they have never reproduced. So we want to be able to allow for individuals not to reproduce even when they were in good health, for example, if they were sterile. Right, in terms of the observation model, uh, for the sightings process, we have um, the probability of sighting an individual in each time step that depends on the um, probability of sighting an individual uh, when, when alive, raw, times the survival state in that time step, and then again, a Bernoulli draw that determined whether uh, the individual was observed or not. And then the observation model for health was essentially linking uh, the underlying health state with uh, uh, visual health assessment variables. So for each visual health assessment variable X, uh, the probability of observing, of observing the first uh, category was a model using a logit formulation. So we had an intercept and then the effect of health. And then for variables with two categories, the probability of observing the second one is just one minus the probability of observing the first. For variables with three categories, we use the ordinal uh, logit formulation that you can see uh, represented there. And so for increasing health, essentially, the probability of observing better scores uh, increases. And so we expect that omega parameter to be uh, negative. And then um, the observations in each time step, of which there could be more than one, uh, emerge from multinomial draw, depending on those uh, probabilities. We use a Bayesian framework to uh, fit this model. Uh, so we, we uh, use MCMC, uh, and um, these were run from JAGS from R. So we're running five uh, uh, parallel chains for 100,000 iterations and using standard uh, convergence and, and mixing uh, diagnostic tools um, to make sure the model was behaving. So some results, and this is the result of the observation model linking health with the four uh, visual health assessment variables. So, so you can see that as we expected for increasing health, we see this progression with the, um, the better scores emerging. And we also looked at how the, um, the, the model was fit in the data. So the goodness of fit, we use this um, modified version of the um, Hosmer and Lencho test, uh, which is modified for ordinal uh, variables. And so basically the lines represent the predictive, uh, sorry, the predicted, uh, the expected frequencies uh for each of those scores in the different uh, health groups and then the dots represent the observed frequencies in our data so you can see a couple of things in this plot first of all sarmid presence is not very informative of um the health of the individual so it's really when health is really poor the sarmid presence starts to tell us something about uh, the health of those individuals and the other thing for body condition you see that the intermediate health scores are um more difficult to assign and again this was something that we were expecting because uh, it's very easy to score an individual in very poor body condition or in very good body condition it's much harder to score somewhere in between um yes so the model estimates the relationship between health and vital rates that you can see on the left so uh, black represents the survival at the three month time scale uh, red represents the survival at the annual scale and then green uh, is the uh, Calvin probability with the different asymptote for each individual. So those lines correspond to uh, all the females in our sample. And the gray shaded area is 95% of the uh, posterior health values. So because Calvin probability and survival probability are both related related to health, we can relate to, uh, which is what I've done on the right. And you can see that Calvin probability essentially drops to uh, zero for survival probability below 0 0.85, more or less, which makes sense from a life history perspective. So I was telling you that uh, we were looking at um, the relationship between health and calving at three potential legs, the end, the middle, and the start of pregnancy. But you can see that that made a little difference to the estimated relationship. And this is because, as you can see on the right, 
the values of health at those three time steps are actually highly correlated. And so it makes sense that um, there's no real difference in the uh, estimated relationship. And it also suggests that uh, with our data, with the visual health assessment variables that are quite coarse, uh, we are not really able to uh, discriminate uh, health variations within the year. Right, so the uh, model returns an estimate of the health trajectory for each individual in the population, uh, which is what you can see on the left in, in gray, each line represents an individual. And then blue is the average, so it's uh, the health of the population if you want. So you can see that um, there was an increase in the overall health of the population up to the 1990s, followed by decrease up to 2000, um, a slow increase then up to 2010, and again a decrease after uh, 2010. And this pattern is strikingly similar to the uh, pattern in the uh, prey abundance index that you can see on the right. We also split that pattern based on uh, the exposure of individuals to anthropogenic traumas. So basically whether the animal was, uh, an animal was struck by a vessel or got entangled. And so on the right is the exposed individuals. And on the left, you see for individuals that never experienced um, these events. So even though the health of the non-exposed individuals is um, overall higher, you can see that the pattern is, uh, is still there. So this suggests that the, uh, the prey indeed um, shows an effect on the health of individuals in this population. We can represent that trend also in terms of the, uh, the vital rates. So on the left, you see survival probability. It's, uh, of course, survival probability is directly uh, related with health. So it makes sense that the pattern is the same. Um, but you can see that the, the decline in recent years appears a bit more evident. Um, in terms of Calvin probability, you can see that actually the decline is uh, quite uh, uninterrupted since the 70s with a slowing down of this trend between 2000 and 2010, but overall Calvin probability has been declined and declining across uh, females. So we wanted to investigate this a bit more. And what we did was basically to split the two components of Calvin probability. Uh, on the right, the component that is associated with health. So again, that pattern is exactly the same as the pattern in health, which makes sense. And um, on the left, you can see the uh, asymptote. So uh, this is the individual random effect on the asymptote. So uh, you can see that uh, that's really what's been driving this, this decline uh, in Calvin probability from the 70s up to 2010, 2020. And so this suggests that basically there is something, some characteristics of these individuals that is not currently captured in our health uh, variable as currently formulated at least, uh, that it explains this de decline in uh, Calvin probability in the last um, few decades. Right, and this is really the juice of the results. Um, the effects of the stressors. Uh, here I'm reporting both the results for the baseline model, which uh, I've talked about so far. Uh, I don't have the time to go into the details about the various alternative formulations that we tried, but essentially there are sources of uncertainty in a lot of these um, sources of data, particularly in the timing of entanglements and vessel strikes, uh, the duration of lactation and so on. So we wanted to make sure that uh, that uncertainty didn't really affect uh, the prioritization of the effects. Um, and so you can see that the effect size does change uh, to some extent, but uh, the relative size of the different stressors um, doesn't. And um, so that, that was, um, comforting uh, and then in terms of the um, the most uh, the, the strongest effects you can see that they are associated with vessel strikes particularly uh, the ones uh, with um, that resulted in in blunt injuries uh, deep uh, and shallow cuts and then entanglements but also but but only if uh, the entanglement was severe so you can see the moderate and minor um, and minor uh, entanglements their effect overlap overlaps with zero you can see the effect of uh, the intrinsic stressor, so lactation and the transition to um, juvenile. The effect of carrying the gear was um, 
small but different from zero. I should say that um, we now think that actually that effect is a bit confounded with the immediate effect of the uh, entanglement, um, which remember the time step is three months. So that immediate effect is not that immediate. It explain it, it can explain uh, the variation in health uh, over a three month period. So uh, we think that we are a bit confounded and we are trying to come up with ways to uh, to formulate this better. Uh, and then you can see the effect of the prey, which again is comparatively uh, small, but uh, it's different from zero. And uh, you should uh, remember that uh, it applies across individuals and it, it can apply um, uh, for multiple years, of course. We can also represent those effects in terms of the uh, vital rates that you can see uh, in green and, and orange. Um, the conclusions are essentially the same, but um, sometimes it, it, it might be more relevant to present those results in terms of a change in survival or a change in calvin probability. Right, so combining all these um, layers um, for each individual in the population, we can estimate um, using this model, the, the health trajectory, which is what you can see in black in the bottom panel with the standard deviation in gray. And so for this female, 1245, um, the black triangle represents the transition to, um, to juvenile. And at the top, uh, in the top panel, you see the various data streams. So uh, this female um, went for a, a couple of um, calving events, which are reflected in uh, the trajectory of her health. And a few entanglements as, uh, as well, uh, although none of them were uh, severe, so they're not really uh, apparent in the health trajectory. These are the uh, these are the example. It's also a female. Again, a few calving events, um, a few uh, entanglement events, but none of them um, severe. And then you can see that vessel strike towards the end of her life history that caused a drop in uh, her health that eventually resulted in her death. And this is an example for a male. Um, again, a few uh, entanglement events, but it's really that severe event towards uh, the end of uh, his life that uh, eventually led to death. Right, so I want to talk about some of the um, things that I'm currently working on um, for this model and um, extensions to this model. So the first thing is the uh, introduction of uh, length and growth into the model. This is motivated by uh, this paper by Stuart et al, uh, published in Current Biology in 2021 that has shown that uh, the size of these uh, individuals in this population has been decreasing over the last few decades. And so we hypothesize that maybe this decrease in size could help us explain the decline in Calvin probability that we couldn't really explain with our health metric. So I've built an additional process model into, um, into the, the, the broader model for length and an associated observation model. So the process model is a compared uh, growth model where the length at each time step is uh, modeled depending on uh, age uh, using those three parameters, A, C, and K. And A is the asymptote, and that's where we uh, can model the effect of covariates following the original paper by Josh Stewart uh, et al. And um, particularly we are modeling the effect of birth uh, here on that asymptote to represent this decline over the last few decades. And then uh, length is observed um, using photogrammetry from drones. Uh, and we, uh, we are modeling the, the, the me measurement process using a, a normal um, distribution with different sigmas depending on the platform that was used, which uh, changed over the years. And then we are uh, linking health and Calvin probability by modeling an effect of length on that asymptote. So we, we are adding essentially to the individual random effect model, we are adding an effect of length using the logit formulation. And we tested different uh, functional forms for that effect. Um, Long story short, the blue curve that you can see in that plot is the best fitting one. So it's a cubic relationship between the length of an individual and the uh, asymptote of Calvin probability, which is quite satisfactory because, um, of course, it's not length uh, that affects Calvin, it's, it's mass, right? So um, length is 
mass is, is derived from the, the cubic uh, cube of length. So uh, it makes sense that we're seeing a cubic relationship between length and uh, Calvin probability. So what does it look like uh, in terms of the results? So again, we have uh, in the top left the, um, the overall trend in Calvin probability which shows this uh, continuous decline in the last five decades. Uh, the middle plot is again the component explained by health, and then the right plot is the asymptote. But the difference now is that we can split that asymptote into uh, its two components. Uh, one is the effect of length, and one is the random effect. And you can see that the random effect is really shrunk um, to, um, to be quite small. And a lot of the variability in the asymptote is actually uh, captured by um, the effect of length on the asymptote. So we think we found a good candidate to, um, to try and capture that variability in Calvin probability that we weren't able to capture using the health metric alone. And I want to thank John Dorban, Michael Moore, and Josh Stewart for their, for their help with this uh, component of the model. We also want to make the model spatially explicit. At the, mom at the moment, it's spatially implicit. Um, but of course, the problem is that animals use the space in different ways uh, at different times of the year. And if this affects their um, exposure to, to stressors. So we want to build a spatial structure into the model. Uh, we don't have enough data to do this at a very fine scale, so we decided to use these uh, coarse regional polygons that you can see represented on the uh, map. And the idea is to split basically the range of the population into functional chunks that represent different um, components of the life history or uh, are of different interest to us. So for example, we have the calving grounds, the, the migratory range, uh, and then we're splitting the feeding, feeding grounds depending on US versus Canada um, and so on. The problem is that even though we have all the sightings, um, the effort associated with those sightings has, has changed uh, over time and in space, and it's not consistently reported. So we can't really correct for it um, in, in a satisfactory way. And there's, there's really no way out of that. Uh, but we decided to um, use two strategies. So we're using basically, basically two extremes of assumptions. And we want to uh, assess what influence those assumptions have on the results. So at the one end, we are using an entirely model-based model approach. We are using uh, particularly uh, Jason Roberts' density surface model um, for the species, and I want to thank him for, um, for his help with that. Uh, essentially, we are uh, summarizing the uh, estimates of density from Jason's model um, by those polygons and uh, using those as um, an indication of how the animals distribute um, in the range. At the other end of the spectrum, we are using this entirely sightings-driven approach where we are ignoring the problem with effort. We are just using the consortium sightings to inform the distribution, and we want to see what difference um what difference that makes and sorry before i go into showing you uh, some preliminary results uh, we're also modeling the uh, way in which different demographic classes use uh, those regions because of course um, that varies as well so this is an example of uh, some of the preliminary results uh, i'm still working on this but um, essentially each column represents a demographic class. Uh, we have adult females, adult males, calves, and juveniles. Each row corresponds to each uh, three-month period, and then the x-axis represents the different regions. And so you can see that uh, different demographic classes use a space quite differently in different seasons. And of course, this heterogeneous use of the range results in heterogeneous exposure to stressors. Which uh, leads me to my next point, which is that we need to build into the model um, spatially explicit stressor surfaces as well, which is, of course, quite tricky uh, because um, we need to be able to access information about the distribution of those stressors in space and in time. So for best of strikes, we are uh, hoping to use this strike risk model that was developed by Lance Garrison. For entanglements, uh, we... Um, uh, we want to use the uh, outputs of this decision support tool that was developed by a team at NOAA, led by Barton Schenk. 
which uh, predicts entanglement risk. Um, and then for prey, we are collaborating with Nick Record, Camille Ross, um, Stefan Pluet, and Katrin Johnson to develop a transboundary Kalanos uh, distribution model that allows us to make predictions about uh, the prey uh, across uh, the, uh, the entire range of the population. And I really want to thank all the people that are helping me collating these uh, complicated data sets, and in particular, uh, Carolyn Miller, who's been uh, instrumental at putting me in contact with uh, all these people and um, doing a lot of the work herself. Right, and then the final extension to this model, which is uh, really our holy grail, uh, is being able to assess stressor interactions, which is the whole point of the frost project. Uh, and we're slowly building towards that. Uh, stressor interactions ca can occur at different levels. So they can occur at the level of health. So we, for example, we could imagine that um, multiple entanglements might have a stronger effect than the first entanglement. Uh, we could have an interaction between prey and entanglement so that uh, an individual that is um, caught in, in fishing gear um, finds it harder to feed. Interactions could occur at the level of length. For example, again, prey and entanglement might interact to uh, stunt the growth of these animals or at the level of exposure. So there could be a change in the prey that led to um, the change in distribution. I was um, discussing earlier, and this could interact with um, the uh, exposure to entanglements and vessel strike leading to uh, greater mortality from these stressors. So if we go back to the PCOMS framework, um, the model we're developing really focuses on these uh, steps. We're looking at exposure to different stressors, their immediate effects on vital rates, or their effects mediated by health. And which is great in terms of looking at uh, effects on individual vital rates, but ultimately uh, we uh, want to come up with a tool that uh, allows us to uh, look at population dynamics. So we're thinking that uh, ultimately we will uh, build these uh, results into a population modeling tool to uh, be able to assess the effectiveness of different management scenarios on the uh, trajectory of the population. Right, some discussion points. Um, I think um, our latent health variable is working really well as an integrator of the effect of stressors that operate along different pathways and the different uh, scales. This model is allowing us to, to compare effect sizes and to integrate these, the effects of these stressors with other factors that might affect an individual, for example, lactation, for example, the juvenile uh, status, but there could be other. Um, we are finding that vessel strikes and entanglements are, have the greatest immediate effect on health, but their effect depends on uh, severity. And the prey, uh, the prey index, uh, has a smaller but protracted effect uh, that applies across individuals. And uh, we are seeing these trends in um, the vital rates that are quite similar to the trend in the prey abundance index, which is quite interesting. The, the, a clear message that comes from this effort is that uh, we need long-term monitoring data for these long-lived species. Uh, it's useful to incorporate some mechanistic knowledge into these models, but it's also clear that um, our visual health assessment variables are uh, quite coarse, so we need better health indicators uh, to represent the underlying health of individuals. With the flip side that I, I want to mention, that this data set uh, is incredible, it's available from the 70s, and uh, it, it's hard to, to match that, um, that long-term data set with a new data set, as powerful as that might be. Um, the fact that we can go back for all these decades with these visual life assessment data is um, is really making this modeling possible. Um, and ultimately, the results could help identify uh, which stressors to prioritize to reduce the overall um, risk to this population and particularly to inform an update of the existing protective policies in light of the recent changes um, in the distribution. So in terms of the management implication, we think implications, we think that uh, reducing the risk of entanglements and vessel strikes could really have uh, immediate benefits on the survival of individuals. 
And because mitigating solutions uh, exist to some extent for some of the stresses, they should be just urgently impl implemented. But from a broader perspective, we are seeing these uh, changes in the oceanography of the North Northwest Atlantic that are climate driven, uh, that are having these cascading consequences on the copepods and leading to these uh, changes in the uh, movements and habitat cues of uh, right whales. So we need a broader ecosystem-based approach and broader policies to uh, address these bigger issues uh, if you will really want to ensure the um, viability of these species. So I'd like to thank um, our funders again, ONR and CERDIP, uh, the PCOMS Working Group, the Consortium for uh, Access to the Data. Uh, there is a paper that is currently in press that um, describes the model up to length. Uh, so it's the non spatial explicit model um, without length. So if you want more details about the structure of the model, um, stay tuned. And we, um, we are as I said, we're still working on the model and uh, we are hoping that those uh, suggested uh, modifications that um, I showed you will become part of the model eventually. And thanks very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> thanks, Enrico. Uh, yeah, uh, we have time for questions online, folks. Um, feel free to either raise your hand or submit a question in the Q&A. Um, yeah, and in-person folks, raise your hand and you can come over here and ask a question if you'd like. Yeah. Yes. Come on over. Hey, Adrian. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Hi, Enrico. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm just curious, the effect size of the gear entanglement was obviously very, there was a big difference between moderate and severe. How are you, How is moderate versus severe entanglement classified? Is it the amount of gear on them? Is it the type of gear? Is it where they're tangled? It's the, it's the injury. Um, I should say that I'm I'm the modeling monkey here, so I don't do any of those scoring. Um, it has to do with the severity of the injury, not with yeah. the with the the type of gear, as far as I know. Uh, but uh, sorry, I, I'm not entirely sure. No, what, no problem. What um, yeah contributes to that uh, assessment? But I know that it has to do with the injury. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, hey, Enrique. Uh, uh, Hi. It's Trevor Branch here. Um, so I have a question. I, I was curious why the the trend for um, the trend for the influence of length and and uh, the probability of giving birth is sort of continuously declining, and yet there's that period in the middle in the ninety in the sorry two thousands when there was a big peak in actual carving. So. How do you reconcile those two things? Yeah, so you, if you remember, there was a that trend kind of slows down uh, in the early two thousands, and that's driven by um, increases in health. So, I think that's where we are seeing a the effect of health contributing to Calvin probability over the decline in. Uh, in length across the, the decades. So yeah, it, it slows down essentially in those uh, in those years. But um, I, I should also say that we are really just starting to investigate this trend and um, we're happy we could find something that could help us explain uh, okay. the decline. Um, but yeah, it's, it needs to be looked at a bit in, in a bit more detail for sure but health does improve in the early 2000s so that could explain that uh, slowing down of that declining trend and the increase in actual calving that you're referring to so I, I guess building on that what's your prediction for the next 10 years are we going to go back to the conditions of the 2000s or we're going to get worse and worse and worse oh god um <laughs> <laughs> I am not making that prediction. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually, I think there are good reasons not to, based on this model alone. Uh, I want to, I, I think there are a couple of key 
things missing. Uh, the spatial structure is one of them and the interactions uh, are also one of them. So I think before we can get to a point where we project um, the population trajectory going forward based on this model, we need to have those two components in the model. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to make that, uh, that prediction at this stage, but uh, maybe at some point in the project, <laughs> Fair I'll, I'll write Fair to enough. you and, and give you my <laughs> my bet. I hope, <laughs> yeah, I hope we'll be able to to say that with the recent uh, protective policies that particularly Canada has put in place after the the shift uh, in the distribution, maybe that mortality has been at least um, addressed and slowed down. Um, yep. We'll see. Thank you. Great talk, by the way. Thank you. It looks like we have a question online. Enrico, can you see it? Um, I can also yeah. read it out loud. Um, yeah, so it's done. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. The data set is so rich and there are clear impacts for specific stressors. How difficult would it be to apply a similar model to southern rest and killer whales? We have less detailed data on pre-availability and no smoking gun on specific causes of death. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a question that we are talking about within the project because ultimately we would like this model to be applicable to other species as well. Um, I think that um, the the critical bit that makes this what the, this model work is the visual health assessment data. There needs to be some sort of um metric that informs how animals are doing um before we see the effects on survival and reproduction because you could always build a model that links those vital rates directly with the stresses which is what a lot of the um, uh, excellent work on right whales has done so far right these uh, these um models where you look at um how reproduction varies as a function of entanglements, for example, or um, as a function of prey. Um, but I think the real power here is this ability of modeling the intermediate step, um, which we call health. I mean, it's a, in our model, it's really a transformed uh, survival probability. But um, I think having a metric that allows you to characterize that latent variable is very powerful and would make this model applicable to other species. So if for the killer whales you have, for example, um, a sufficiently long time series of um, photogrammetry data, for example, that could inform the underlying body condition of individuals over time and link that with uh, their life history performance in terms of calving particularly um, and death. I think a model like this could be applicable. So it's the long time series, but particularly the health variables that um, are important. I hope this answers and I'm happy to discuss separately as well um, if, if you want to talk about an application, another application. Sounds good. Awesome. Any other questions from anyone in the room or online? All right, it looks like that's it for questions. Thank you so much, Enrico. This was a really great presentation. We really appreciate uh, you being here with us, even though it's like 9.30 PM for you now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, and thanks everyone for coming to QuantSign. We'll have another great talk next week. Um, yeah, have a good weekend. Thank you. You too.